digital divide prevents Indigenous youth from actively participating in Canadian politics, including, and especially, the policies that directly impact them. How can Indigenous youth participate in Arctic policy, or speak about their traditional ways to a larger audience when they can't even log on? This video is going to explore the importance of involving youth via technology, and the juxtaposition with the ongoing technological gap between Northern and Southern communities in Canada. Hi, my name is Gwani Kovacic-Bignia. I'm currently a teacher on the traditional territory of the Liard First Nation in Watson Lake, Yukon Territory. This video comes to you out of an ongoing issue I've witnessed during my time in six communities in all three of Canada's territories, including all of the other factors that put my Indigenous students at a disadvantage in the educational system, which is a video in itself. The cherry on top of this metaphorical Sunday is the huge disparity in access to internet and technology. The Indigenous youth population in Canada is growing at a pace four times faster than the rest of the country's youth, the report says, and Indigenous people create new businesses at nine times the Canadian average. And while Indigenous youth remain a growing cohort, they remain a largely untapped resource because of digital equity. Digital equity is a state in which every Indigenous person, community, and nation is fully equipped to access and effectively use technology to contribute, thrive, and succeed in today's digital society while preserving self-determination. Digital equity is more than access to computers and the internet because technology directly impacts society. Digital equity means innovation, self-governance, entrepreneurship, education, economic, and cultural well-being. Nearly all aspects of rights implementation stems from the access to the digital age we live in. Last year, the federal government promised to make sure 98% of the country had access to high-speed internet within five years. Despite this commitment to better internet by the government, a report by RBC says more than three quarters of households in First Nation communities don't have internet. Many parts of First Nation reserves across the country have no telephone landlines, let alone broadband internet access. Even the most available mobile service is patchy at best. In the territories, it is unusual for the internet to cut out, slow down, or stop working. And unlike most places in Canada, there isn't the option for unlimited internet. There is the option, however, for high fees, low coverage, and monthly data caps. At White Horse and Yellowknife, many communities rely on a patchwork system of microwave repeater stations or satellite links that, by their very nature, choke off speeds and drive up costs. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought into sharp focus the digital divide which exists in Indigenous communities and remote and rural regions. In 2016, it was recorded that roughly 60% of Indigenous peoples lived in predominantly rural areas and for Canadians living in the North, where Indigenous people make up the majority of the population, I would argue that number is much higher. Some 86% of Canadian households have access to unlimited data packages and 94% have access to broadband speeds of at least 25 megabits. A report commissioned by Nunavut says that it would cost a single Nunavut household at least seven grand annually to reach the average. $7,000. RBC report I mentioned earlier also says that rapid expansion of high-speed broadband internet and greater access to digital tools will be critical for Indigenous youth to take advantage of the decentralized post-pandemic economy and position them for new opportunities in online health and education services, e-commerce and digitally enabled mining, forestry, and agriculture. This discrepancy makes it impossible for Indigenous communities to connect with family and friends, to share and receive important information, and to benefit from the same internet access that most Canadians have. The lack of digital literacy, the high cost of online access, and the lack of connectivity are just byproducts. The government has not adequately invested the infrastructure needed for Indigenous communities to have fast, reliable internet. This disproportionate digital divide is a human rights and equity issue. It's not random. Indigenous peoples are denied an essential service that governments globally have stated is essential to living in the present age. Literally, the United Nations declared access to internet a human right. Having access to the internet means being able to exercise other fundamental human rights and freedoms like the right to freedom of speech. Closing the digital divide means more opportunities for Indigenous people to participate in a digital future while preserving their self-determination. So, knowing all of this, why does it actually matter, aside from the fact that the digital divide impacts access to education before and during a global pandemic? 
limits health care, that's a basic human right, that's being denied systemically to a group of people simply because of who they are. Let's make this question slightly smaller. Why does this matter to policy? The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is an organization that works to build better policies for better lives and one that Canada is a member of among 30 other nations. They released a report entitled Engaging Young People in Open Government. The whole purpose of the report is to highlight how to better engage youth, which they state often find it more difficult than other segments of society to make their voices heard. One portion of this report is solely dedicated to reaching youth in the appropriate environment, which they include the online world in. The report states that young people also increasingly experience life through online communities, social media networks, forums, games, and activist movements shape young people's sense of identity and purpose in powerful ways, as 95% of 16-year-olds in OECD countries use the internet in 2016. It's important that communication strategies include both face-to-face -face and online communication activities. Further on in the report, there's a section specifically on digital engagement. It states, social media and digital engagement offer a counter-argument to the idea that contemporary youth are less engaged politically than previous generations. Campaigns, protests, and boycotts frequently spread quickly via social networks such as Twitter or Facebook and blogs, and have been proven to be effective in channeling activity towards specific outcomes such as boycotts. OECD believes that these networked young citizens are finding new ways to make their voices heard via horizontal networks that are more individualized, which should be understood as an equally valid form of political participation. If you keep reading the report, though, it points out one very important fact. There are questions of inequality and inclusivity that are at play in digital networks. Access to online tools and networks is itself distributed unevenly, with rural areas often having poor internet provision and access to computers and smartphones reflects the broader socioeconomic patterns of income inequality. Let's say that this is just one report written by a very well-supported international body and we need to look at other agencies to confirm this. Perhaps you've heard of UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, which is present in almost 200 countries. UNICEF released a report entitled Digital Civic Engagement by Young People which provides an overview of the latest research relating to youth civic engagement in the digital space. UNICEF says that it, digital engagement is contiguous with, complementary to, and inseparable from offline engagement when it comes to youth activism. This report provides such a vast array of evidence supporting that youth are turning to the digital to become involved. The report by UNICEF states, young people globally are turning to new digitally mediated forms of civic engagement that are more difficult for tools such as traditional polling to measure and may be less analytically straightforward. For example, acts of participatory politics such as youth creating and circulating videos, memes and videos to their networks. A 2018 survey across 14 countries concluded that young people aged 18 to 29 are more likely to participate in political discussions online than older adults. The same study found that the social network site usage, which skews younger and more educated than non-users, was positively correlated with respondents' likelihood to take political action across the issue studied. In addition, instead of engaging isolated discrete events or practices, young people are adopting a repertoire approach to civic engagement that blends an array of digital and real-life actions in a cumulative and recursive fashion. Just for good measure, let me throw in one more international organization. The Open Government Partnership as representatives from 78 countries and 76 local governments. From Ontario, a report was released that's entitled Give Young People More Opportunities to Contribute to the Development of Government Programs and Services by Working in Partnership with Youth to Implement a Digital Engagement Tool. I probably don't need to give you much more information, but I would like to point out that it does say the way to harness this collective energy of our youth is through digital platforms. Long story short, the way to involve youth in policy work is through technology. The digital divide has historical origins in Canada's colonialism. This divide reinforces the patterns of underdeveloped economics and cultural marginalization and social exclusion. Internet technology is a mechanism of autonomy and self-determination for the Indigenous population in Canada. Autonomy and self-determination are directly related to the policies that are created in Canada. The policies in Canada impact the Canadian public, of which the fastest growing section is Indigenous youth. 
Indigenous youth should therefore have a voice in policy work. Indigenous youth cannot have a voice in policy work because they do not have an autonomous voice or ability to speak to self-determination because they don't have access to internet technologies.